Um, so hello everyone, welcome to the publishing education panel discussion, which I'm very excited about. My name is Nick Hilton. I work for Coach House Books. I'm the digital and distribution uh, manager there. Um, I've been there for a couple of years and also just a bit of context. Uh, I have taught the production, which is public, the, uh, the product content management production side of publishing at Centennial College. Um, and I am also doing Mohawk College's right now accessible media program, which has been very fun for me. So it's just a bit of context in terms of my connection and my experience um, in uh, talking about publishing and education. So if I can just have everyone on the panel, just take a quick minute uh, just to say who you are and where you're from. We don't have a lot of time for a lot of background, but if you can just go with that. And of course, full bios are available for everyone. Uh, Monique, would you mind starting? Sure, um, I'm Monique Manjon. I work at BookNet during the day. And then after hours, I teach digital publishing and production at Ryerson University's publishing program. Um, I've been teaching for about four years. So that is what we do there. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne, would you mind going next? Uh, not at all. Uh, Suzanne Norman, I teach in the publishing program at SFU and I work closely with industry on um, various events. Um, one of them is trying to get more accessibility into our courses, in our publishing courses. For sure. Thank you. And uh, Jillian, or I see your name is Jill on the screen. I'm not sure what you prefer, but if yeah, you Yeah, no, I next. just go by Jill. Okay. Um, yes, I'm Jill. I'm from the SFU Print and Digital and Minor program as a student. Thank you. And last but not least, Karen. Uh, Karen McCall, uh, Carlin Communications. I have over 20 years in digital accessibility. I'm an advocate for a global inclusive education standard, and I'm part-time faculty at Mohawk College's uh, Accessible Media Production Program. Thank you. Karen was actually my instructor on a course that I have just finished. So this is a very different context that we are meeting. Um, but I know her from there. So um, as uh, Leah mentioned, this is going to be a 30 minute panel discussion. Um, we're going to stop it at 30 minutes. There's no time. Well, we are not, um, we have an incorporated question and answer period for the 30 minute panel discussion, just because of course the working sessions after um, once we formally transition into that time, that can become question and answers and lots of open discussion. Um, so uh, thank you very much everyone for joining and we will dive in on that note. I do have a list of questions, but hopefully the conversation can just be free flowing. But to start us off, I will ask, maybe each person could take, the, take a moment to answer this question from their own experience um, and context. What uh, is currently, um, if we can hear what is currently included in the curriculum uh, as, as a teacher or what you believe is included in the curriculum. Um, and if, uh, that would probably open up to also what is not included in the curriculum. Monique, would you like to start? I sure. Sorry on the spot. No, that's okay. Um, so in my sort of courses curriculum, we're really focused specifically on developing EPUB in a born accessible way. So we kind of make the assumption that most of our students are coming from a non-technical background. A lot of our students are like me, uh, former English majors. So we have not taken computer science and maybe don't have a background in code. Um, so we kind of start from that point and then work towards building fully accessible EPUB 3 by the end of the course. Um, so that's sort of the scope. Um, I don't take accessibility out and like separate it as its own block. My sort of desire is to just pretend building accessibly is just how it's supposed to be because I believe that that's true. Um, and then that way it sort of becomes the framework on which you build your skills in code and in EPUB specifically. Um, I would say what's missing from what we do in this course is any coverage of Onyx metadata and the way that that can be used to communicate accessibility. Um, just because we have a limited amount of time in the semester, there hasn't been a ton of time for that. So that's that's where I see the biggest miss opportunity in the curriculum of my course currently. 
Great, thank you. Maybe we can hear um, from SFU from, from both perspectives. Suzanne, if you wanted to start. Sure. Um, well, I'm kind of looking at it from both perspectives because we, uh, we have a Center for Accessible Learning, CAL, um, at SFU, which is supposed to help facilitate students, um, students with accessibility uh, concerns uh, they're supposed to help facilitate them in, in the classroom. And so Jill can speak to that a little bit more. Um, Jill has been my student for a number of courses now. Uh, so she could talk a little bit about the needs and the lack of um, the lack of response, I think, from, from Cal, I'll be candid. Um, we, we, as instructors, we get information from them saying, you have a student in your class that has accessibility concerns and da 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 it's a cumbersome and really convoluted process to be able to um to make the the things needed um to get them into place on the other side of it um in teaching publishing courses we really have not done a good job at up to this point um we have sort of it's unlike monique um where you've built in things and they're not separate blocks, we have been doing separate blocks as a kind of an add-on and it's not good enough. So what, um, what we've proposed is building a completely new course on accessible publishing, um, but looking at it from a whole bunch of perspectives, not just from the ebook or the creation of books and content, um, but looking at accessible issues from all across the board uh, peer reviews, um, journal articles, how to make communications more accessible across the publishing aspects of a university. So, um, and from there, we hope to build out a few more courses and have them in specific streams. Um, that first course is in development um, and Jill will be working on it with us as well as Laura Brady. Um, one of the things we did do this past year in um, one of my undergrad courses, the book publishing process, was to bring in Laura to speak with the students to get them to work on a, a couple of projects. And we hired her to do an entire um, module or, or lecture based on uh, her experience. So we're building from that and um, we hope to do much better with with our work. Um, I, I hope Jill talks a little bit about her experience in the design course she did with Natalie Gagnon. Um, I think Jill has been a catalyst for us and, and sadly it took that to help us be a little bit more aware of what we need to do. Yeah, the um, when Laura came and talked to our class, that was like pretty much the only accessible publishing topic there was throughout any of my publishing classes, unfortunately. Um, but I've like throughout my classes and with different program or different assignments, um, I kind of brought components of accessibility into them. So like Suzanne was saying, I took a graphic design course a couple years ago now. And the whole process was like designing our own book. And me with a visual assistant, we found ways to make like tactile diagrams and to show like tactilely different fonts that I could choose and different layouts. We made those all tactile, but that was more through our creative process, not like through the school so much. Um, so it's definitely improving with accessibility in pu the publishing program. And I'm really excited to see it move forward, especially being, as far as I know, one of the only visually impaired students in the publishing program. Um, but like Suzanne had mentioned with the Center for Accessible Learning, I have to go through them to get all of my materials um, converted into accessible formats for all my classes, but they go through a secondhand party in the library. So it's like a big roundabout thing to get my materials. So that's a big accessibility issue. So, yeah. Thank you both for your uh, different, it's so nice to have a, uh, two sides of the perspective of uh, education um, in terms of being a student and an instructor. Karen, I'm wondering if you want to add anything about uh, your feelings or experience about what's currently included in curriculum uh, or what is missing. Um, well, the, the whole push for my piece of 
a, um, an, a global inclusive education uh, standard is to have a, an international standard that has a baseline for accessibility so that when any student in primary education puts their hands on a computer, they're just automatically creating things that are accessible. And as other people have mentioned, it's not an add-on, it's not uh, you need to make this special, it's just this is how we create content. This is how we create multimedia. This is how we create buildings. This is how we create documents. Um, I see a big opportunity for both primary and tertiary education having leadership roles at the moment, uh, especially with, you know, what we've seen in, in terms of COVID at being able to say, we now know how much digital content, including textbooks and, and journal articles and library material are not accessible. So how can we as leaders who are creating uh, the, the teachers, the publishing people, the um, multimedia people, how can we start just incorporating and training our faculties on creating things that are accessible from the start? And if we do that, then once we get into like a few years down the road into tertiary education, we can focus on the enhancements for the publishing tools uh, instead of having to have everybody go back to kind of the basics and, and uh, look at, you know, this is how you create an accessible document or this is how you create accessible content. So my approach is based on uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Goal 4.5 is to have inclusive education. By 2030, the problem is everyone has a different definition of what inclusive education is, which is why I want to get people together and say, uh, you know, as a, as a global community, we need to discover and identify exactly what we're talking about. And in terms of digital accessibility, it means as soon as we start using computers, we're creating things that are accessible. It doesn't matter whether it's digital, uh, like print or uh, building plans or maps or whatever we're creating, it's just accessible. Right. So I'm wondering, like, what are the challenges? Maybe we can talk about the challenges both in um, for publishing specific programs and getting accessibility built into the curriculum, but also like in general, because what we're talking about right here is, and I agree with you, of course, that everyone uh, should be learning accessibility practices and teaching it. But what I can I can think of 20 challenges already, of course, I'm sure everyone else <laughs> here can as well. Um, the first and foremost is that everyone who is teaching on whatever level, whatever subject needs to have that skill set themselves in order to teach it. Um, so perhaps we can start talking about that. Uh, Suzanne, I, I see you want to say something, so jump right in. I just want to ask Karen a question, actually. Um, so with the standards, because I look at places like BISG, right, um, or BookNet, places where you build standards and you get industry buy-in and so it just happens like EPUB standards took quite a while to get everybody to, to buy into those. So would it be something like that um, that you envision so that an industry-led organization or association or, or co-op group would actually be the driving force I guess within the publishing industry not specifically within the educational industry but um, to make books more universally accessible and as you say from like born accessible. Yes, in, in terms of in terms of publishing, it it would probably have to be industry led. But it, again, with the bigger picture, if we're also approaching this from the educational standpoint, um, having both uh, entities working together so that they're not working at odds with each other and and uh, as a as a global community we're not developing an uh, inclusive education standard that then um, has excluded publishers from participating and saying this is what's possible this is what we can do this is how as a global community we can break down some of the the barriers the 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 goal of what i'm i'm looking at is to make sure that any any person who wants an education has access to an education on an equal footing. So access to textbooks and um, in speaking at conferences, this is one of the, the biggest problems is getting textbooks 
that are accessible. And looking at some of the comments from the, the panelists before, um, I am getting asked a lot of times now, how can I, how can I know when I'm going into um, to a template that it's accessible? I don't want to start working on a template that I've downloaded only to find out it's not accessible and I have to fix it. How do I know if I'm ordering a textbook online that it's accessible? Um, and, and before that, it was how do I know if I'm registering for a class that the class is accessible? that everything that's being um, used in the classroom is accessible, whether it's the textbooks or the applications that teachers bring in or the, the learning management system. So there are a lot of layers. And, and Nick, I have, I have encountered probably your 20 challenges and more, but the, what I want is to start people talking on the same page instead of everybody's on a different page defining things differently and not talking to each other. I, if I could just add one thing, I guess the different there are two different things happening because we're we're teaching publishing students to enter the publishing industry and to have the skills and to have that base knowledge of just making everything accessible from the beginning. Um, and then there's the other side of, of the people using the books. Um, so I guess from um, a person who teaches publishing, I would love to see, and I would be happy to, to work on pushing some of the associations like BISG or BookNet to um, make these standards just practice. So when you teach publishing, just like you teach EPUB, you would teach accessibility. And um, I think that's what I would love to see happen um, from that perspective. As someone who has a visual disability and uses a screen reader, I and and having to do research for for uh, book the book chapters that I I contribute to or other things, just the sheer amount of inaccessible content that I have to work around in order to to be productive. Um, you know, I can spend a month just trying to get a few articles accessible enough to start skimming through and realize that there's nothing really there that that is of value to what I'm trying to research. So it, it is very frustrating, uh, which is another reason I'm approaching things this way is, is uh, it's kind of selfish. I, I, need to have access, I need to have accessible digital content. Of course. Yeah, and I could speak from that as well. Um, just like being fully blind and all the accessible technology that I use, like screen readers and like within like getting materials in time to be prepared for class is one thing, but also like within our publishing courses, we learn a lot about like different types of binding and like margin like sizes and different books book sizes. Um, but like, I can only imagine what those look like. Like, it'd be nice to have some kind of tactile materials in, like implemented for that. So then I'm not just guessing and like half understanding. Um, but again, like making those tactile materials takes time that we don't have throughout a semester to always make or have ready. So there's a lot of frustration behind just like getting materials available in the right amount of time as well. That's a big issue. Yeah, absolutely. I think when Nick mentioned challenges, my the biggest challenge I face every semester is that I only have students for a limited time. I have 12 or 13 weeks, if there's a reading week in there, um, <laughs> to, to deliver the whole course and also make sure everyone has the supports they need to succeed in the course. And, and there can be really unforeseen challenges. I'm lucky in that the course I teach has been developed with the distance learning department to be fully accessible and available in an online format. But um, even recently, like Chromebooks, for example, can't run the software that I use to deliver the course. And as more and more students are using Chromebooks as their home computers and don't have access right now due to the pandemic to on-campus computer libraries and computer labs to access non-Chromebook computers, um, you know, halfway through the semester, someone will be like, oh, my Chromebook can't operate this program and I'm like scrambling to find a Chromebook version of this specific script and nobody has one and then I have to learn how to write one in the middle of a semester. Um, that kind of thing can be really complicated 
And then the timeline becomes a different challenge as well when you're trying to think of, you know, there's, if this is the one course they have that covers accessibility in any significant way, um, unlike some of the other programs like SFU, the Ryerson program, students can kind of take courses piecemeal. They don't have to take the full publishing program if they don't want to. Um, so if they're taking only my course and my course is an elective, if that's the only place they're gonna learn about accessibility, I have 13 weeks to not only teach them how to learn to code, but also why accessibility matters and all the ways it can impact the rest of the publishing process. Um, because I don't know for sure that other instructors are gonna be covering that content in the areas of the publishing process that they touch in their courses. Um, and that, that's just a very short amount of time to try to drive home this kind of big sort of cross industry accessibility need and, and to kind of drive it home enough that I can hope that they'll ask the right questions in the courses that I don't teach uh, <laughs> and kind of help those instructors find their way to making their content address the accessibility challenge um, and rise to that occasion as well. I have the same problem just trying to teach accessible Word and PowerPoint because you'll have people with Macs, you'll have, and of course, your different yeah. tools, different location for things. Um, and I mean, even in the in the PDF, there are, there are slight differences. And 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 my course is three weeks. So oh my I god, have, yeah, I know. I have to. <laughs> it's I a have very to... intensive course, I can say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. And the whole issue of Chromebooks brings up uh, another issue. Uh, in talking about reading systems, uh, one of the things that is emerging now is that uh, in the Microsoft ecosystem, you have Narrator, and it works really well with uh, native Microsoft products, but doesn't play so well with uh, things that students might need uh, in terms of other applications. And I'm not thinking of the ones that instructors just find on the internet and think it's a good idea to put into the course. And it's the same with Chromebooks. So those of us who use adaptive technology will have a screen reader. We may have screen magnification software. And because it is more uh, generic and in private sector, it tends to work with more applications. So when we're looking at Narrator, for example, uh, in the Microsoft ecosystem, it doesn't read PDFs it, because that's an Adobe product and you know, heaven help them if they cross pollinate. So we end up having to balance in our heads uh, keyboard commands for the operating system, keyboard commands for the word processing system and any other tool that we're using, uh, keyboard commands for uh, the internet, keyboard commands for PDF documents. Uh, and then you have different commands for, for Google Docs and different commands for open office. And, and so if we're trying to optimize our, um, our productivity and if people are using different applications, we're stuck in, in uh, ecosystems or reading systems where we can't use um, our adaptive technology. We're forced to learn different adaptive technology. And I can tell you it gets very confusing because you're so used to using specific um, keyboard commands or having access to specific tools. And then all of a sudden you're in a different ecosystem and you don't have access to it. So in talking even about reading systems for, for public publishers, making sure that yes, you may have your own onboard tools for accessibility, but you also need to include the hooks so that those of us who are using mainstream adaptive technology can use our technology to access that, that content. Yeah, go ahead, Susan. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry. I just, this is such a great experience to be able to, to hear what's going on. I'm curious cool. when, I, um, when you were you were saying that your distance ed department worked with you to create your course and to make it more accessible. Um, was that something that you had to initiate or does Ryerson, when new courses are developed, are they all developed now as born accessible? Yeah, know? yeah, they do have in the distance department a, a whole team working on accessibility, I believe mainly driven by the um, AODA requirements for Ontario, trying to make sure that all the new courses that come online are 
meeting that sort of threshold for accessibility. I was particularly aggressive in making sure that my course could be delivered not only fully accessibly, but also fully asynchronously because a, a yep. kind of different aspect of accessibility is like the accessibility of time um, and being able to serve students who want to be able to do a course that they could work on at five or six in the morning if that's the time they have available. Um, and so part of that meant making sure that everything was available in a text-based format so that people didn't have to watch a video recording of a lecture um, or, or kind of engage with like a lot of visual material. I wanted to make sure that everything, everything could be fully accessible for, for people who need like sort of a raw text version of all the content so that it could be access through different adaptive technology. And also, you know, I feel like part of it too, is if my course is about publishing accessible material, you kind of have to walk the walk on that. Yeah. Um, and it would have been really embarrassing if my <laughs> course was not accessible. I guess I was just curious, it, like, so that's for your distance ed courses. Of course, we're all teaching remotely now. And mm -hmm. so there's this blend of what's a distance ed course and what's a regular course that's being taught remotely. Um, there, there's no requirement that our courses be built accessible. And I, I want to correct that. Um, do you know if the courses, the backlist of courses are being redeveloped to be accessible? Or is I that think, a I think the pandemic was a, a lucky accident in that it's forcing people to develop their courses for online delivery. So I think uh, well, the pandemic has been terrible for lots of reasons. I think it did inspire a lot of those courses that had been developed before the accessibility requirements were set up by the distance learning department that now they're going back and starting to address that in a more fulsome way. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of the other courses are more lecture focused in their online delivery. Um, and depending on the material that might be just as accessible because learning to code is such a different process than, you know, learning about becoming a literary agent. Um, I felt that the more asynchronous material yeah. delivery was just a better fit for the type of material I'm trying to teach. Um, but yeah, the pandemic has, I think, been great for the development of distance learning and people kind of acknowledging the problems in those course delivery methods. But um, I think there's still probably a lot to be done to bring all the courses up to up to that level. And I'm kind of grappling with what the accessibility of my course will look like the next time I deliver it in person and how I can improve that experience as well um, to make sure that my in-classroom students can have the same accessible experience that my online students have right now. Thank you. Um, time flies when you're having fun. We just have a, a few more minutes left of the, <laughs> the more formal panel discussion. Um, but so I was wondering before, and of course, this conversation will continue, which I'm very excited about uh, in the working session component of it. Um, but in the last couple of minutes, I'm just wondering if we can talk about future future land, which is always dreamy and perfect and wonderful. And I was wondering if we could each uh, the panelists give our thoughts from your experience, um, either as a student or teaching, what you think, what you hope the, the, the perfect uh, either program or specific course or um, as a student enrolling in a course, like what what is the perfect scenario? Like what what is the, the dream goal here? Because um, I've heard I, I, I personally, just to start it for a quick second, um, in my experience teaching at Centennial, uh, I, I hope for Centennial's future and other similar publishing programs that, um, I guess the question is like, should there be a course in, on the program level that is uh, specific to accessibility overall, where we're imposed like talking about the values of accessibility, the importance of it, um, and those sort of a higher level. And then of course, every course, like there's an editing class, there's a production class, there's a design class, uh, acquisitions, and should all of those classes then be teaching an accessibility component as well? Or should it be one specific accessibility course that is 
in the same way that they're specifically editing in production. Um, that's on the program level. I'm just wondering if we can hear from each panelist in our last couple of minutes, um, what sort of your dream scenario is either enrolling in a program or class or teaching one. Um, yeah, I can go. I, if I could have, so what I want to see is basically kind of a bit of both of what you said. So like, I would love to see a course all designed around accessible publishing and like how to program those into a, like different accessibility components into a book. And like, if there could be some kind of s simulation showing what it's like to, as a reader with a print disability, um, I would love to see a course specifically around accessible publishing. But I also think that in the different courses of like editing, design, um, et cetera, like I would also love to see accessible components built into those courses as well. I would love to see that happen. And I guess to add to Jill, um, well, the first thing we are doing, and it's now brought to the Dean's level for the funding is to create that one course about accessible publishing, which I mentioned at the top. And that will be something that's going to be, it'll be part of our publishing program, but it will touch on topics that are applicable across all faculties. So if a student in um, health science, for example, wants to know how to make their materials or um, you know to publish things that are accessible born accessible then they can take this course and learn the fundamentals but on top of that we also need to build in components in each of the courses to make sure that they are one accessible um, to all students and two that the curriculum itself the content itself is teaching best practices and accessibility so our, our first job is to build that course um, and can, in conjunction with that, we're also revisiting all of the publishing courses to make sure that they will be more inclusive. So it's working. We're doing that. <laughs> You're in future land. One, one toe in. Yeah. My wildest dream for education, both in digital accessible publishing and just education and publishing overall, um, I think there needs to be more mid-career type professional development for professionals mm -hmm. yep. who need to be educated. There's so many established professionals in publishing who don't know anything about accessibility and aren't thinking about it. Yes. And we can't just like wait for them all to get through their careers and retire before <laughs> accessible publishing starts at the beginning. Um, so I would like to see more opportunities for that kind of development. Um, I would also like to see more career opportunities in accessible publishing for students. I have students producing professional level work every semester and there's maybe if they're lucky like three jobs to apply for in the next six months um, and that's really hard for them to keep those skills sharp and stay passionate about this sector like kind of sector of the industry when there's just very few places for them to go. And I know with the Canada Book Fund Accessible Digital Books funding that that has improved and there are more students um, with careers. One of my former students is here, so that's exciting for me. Um, but I, I think those are kind of my two big dreams. And then also to see accessible content and the impact of accessible publishing brought through all the rest of the courses in the program so that students in all in all areas learn about creating accessible content and then take that into whatever department or career uh, path they move forward with in publishing because it shouldn't just be the digital book publishers who care about this. So why don't we all get together and create a few online pro D courses and they're you know offered through because we're all remote you could bring in people from Ryerson and Centennial and, and whatever, and we also have a meet in the online space and, and do some pro D stuff. Sign me up. Okay. <laughs> Let's do that. I there, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by what I've seen just in accidentally in the last six months. Um, I come at publishing from the textbook part from the alternate text production uh, side of things, having contact with students and universities who are trying to get things accessible, not necessarily from the, the publishing side. So I'm looking at the, the software. Um, and there was uh, an, an InDesign plus accessibility summit that they didn't think was going to have a lot of people interested. And they were overwhelmed. 
by the number of, of people from all stages of InDesign skills who were interested in um, creating accessible content from, from InDesign. I attended a couple of meetups from uh, just because the, the topic was interesting. And there are groups of people who are involved in publishing and, and uh, using InDesign and graphic design and that who are learning on their own how to create accessible um, content. And then they get together in the meetups and they all share information. They're not always um, uh, politically correct and they, they sometimes use profanity, but they're, um, they're learning and they're sharing uh, so the uh, the grassroots uh, desire to learn about accessibility and how to produce accessible content is growing. I was encouraged again in the the original panel for the for this afternoon that students with without disabilities seem to be discovering tools that they can use um, to access information in a different way. And one of the things I advocate is tool for task, not tool for disability. So there are times when I'll use screen yeah. magnification. There's times when I use screen readers. There's times when I use um, voice recognition. So just um, having discussions around inclusion in all of the aspects that you were talking about, the, the supply chain management, the, the retail, the creation of the, the digital content, just to keep that thread flowing through all parts of, uh, of publishing, I think is, is important so that people don't lose track of it. Absolutely. Well, on that note, I just, I want to thank all of you panelists, Monique, Suzanne, Jill, and Karen, um, for participating and having this great conversation. I really value uh, your individual perspectives, and I think that we have kickstarted what will be a great working session. So I'm going to just stop recording.